and that our hearts were made for spousal love with him. And that needs to be taught from day dot. Like it's not just about teaching people, teaching children that one day you might have a wedding day, you might wear a white dress, you might get down on one knee and ask a girl to marry you. Like it's not just about that conversation. We need to be having the conversation about, yeah, but why? Why do we do that? Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Living Fullness. I'm Stina Constantine and joining me on the podcast is Father Sean Burns. Each week you'll hear us chat about a range of topics from virtue to relationships, comments on cultural shifts and lessons we're learning as we go along and we are always happy to have you join us. So sit back and enjoy being part of a conversation with a couple of friends. How are you going, Padre? Well, thank you, Stina. How are you going? I'm doing well. Uh, That's the good stuff. How goes the cathedral? Oh, it's still running. Hey, it's still going. Success. It's, it hasn't uh, hasn't fallen down. It's yeah. still uh, yep, yep. You're halfway yep. through the year and and surviving. Wonderful. So, and so are the people of God. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they're probably more important. Thank goodness. So, for that. Uh, have you so? Yeah, good, good. Yeah. Things are in a, a good rhythm at the moment. Mm. So yeah, I think life's good. Yeah, yeah, good, good, excellent. We have so? a episode that I've been looking forward to for a while. This is something Indeed. we've spoken about uh, maybe two seasons ago yeah. now and then decided, you know what, we might just put this one aside for a little bit. So really excited that we're finally at a point where we can have a conversation about marriage preparation. Marriage preparation. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm. And I guess this uh, – One of the reasons why I wanted to have this conversation is because I feel as though as a church we're really letting people down when it comes to marriage preparation. I don't feel like we have enough supports and resources ready and available for people to access when it comes to marriage preparation. So particularly when I think about young people, Mm. I don't think that we're actually adequately supporting young couples in preparing for marriage and part of the problem with that is because we actually don't speak about marriage yeah yeah (laughs) very much yeah we just we don't have a lot of dialogue Mm. around marriage until a couple's engaged (laughs) yeah and then all of a sudden it's okay now let's talk marriage preparation and Mm. you know Mm. six months one year maybe two years at most you know and then they're married and then there's also no conversation about marriage Beyond that, then it's talking about family and how do we raise children. So there's a very small window where we actually have a conversation around marriage. Um, So I guess a conversation today is around what can we do in this space? What are some of the 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 problems that we're seeing that are coming from this, Uh, and what can what can we as a community do to kind of help in this space? Yeah, definitely. So. I think the first thing to just to point out in regards marriage prep then is that an adequate marriage preparation has remote, proximate and immediate dimensions. Um, what I mean by that is that marriage prep is not something that we start once people are engaged, mm. which you pointed out before, you know, once, mm. once they're engaged, we're like, yeah, here's a program, you know? Yeah. And, and no matter how good a program is, it does not supply for what should have been, let's say the couple is, 25 and 27 this program that's thrown at them at the the time of engagement does not supply for the the marriage prep that should have been given to them 27 years ago yeah you know like like marriage prep begins from, from the birth of the child why because they learn what a loving family dynamic looks like within the context of a family. That's what a family is meant to do. Not that every family does that. I know there's there's a multitude of experiences there, right? But what a family is meant to do is to provide that background in which they can see, oh, that's what a husband and wife look like. That's that's remote preparation. That's mum and dad imaging to the kids what a healthy relationship looks like. Now, I think we're actually at a stage where marriage prep has been in, in such a state of disillusionment for so long (laughs) that Mm. we now have mums and dads who have children aged 17 and 18, 19, who have not necessarily imaged what that actually looks like or have not successfully imaged it or haven't known how to image it or have not been supported in Mm -hmm. imaging it, right? Or all of the above. all of the above, Mm -hmm. you know. And and, and so it's it's quite a a difficult set of circumstances Mm. there. 
Um, and that's not just, I'm not just talking in extra ecclesial circles. I'm not just talking in outside no, of the church. Yeah, I'm talking yeah. inside yeah, the absolutely. church. Yeah, absolutely. Among every quarter. Yeah. Not just limited to one quarter, this or that quarter. Among every quarter of the church, I think that's a, it's an ongoing reality and problem. And, and um, so, and then we have sort of approximate preparation, which says, okay, you're at the age of 16, 17. You know, like you're, you're now thinking about what your life's going to look like in the future. And mm. hey, we're going we're gonna to get you ready for, for the fact that one day, not that far from now, you know, in your 20s or 30s, you're going to find yourself uh, married. And, and uh, uh, let's have a look at, at what that might look like. And, and uh, uh, you know, that's, that's sort of giving them a bit of a sense of, of what marriage looks like, what responsibility looks like, what maybe raising kids might look like, what the responsibilities are there, even things like finance, how to do taxes, how to save, and uh, uh, sort of also addressing the the various issues of sexuality and 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 human love. Uh, you know, we, we have a we have a ton of sex education that floods our schools. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we have next to no love education. Mm-hmm. Uh, you mm-hmm. know, so mm-hmm. so. So that's a, a you know, this this sort of proximate education, proximate preparation is, is kind of um, also neglected to some degree. Yes. And then we've got the immediate dimension, which suffers always almost because the previous two have in some way, yeah. shape or form been neglected. Yeah. Right. Uh, so the immediate dimension being you're engaged, you're about to get married, let's talk about marriage, and that, which is awesome. Like, you yeah, know, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's talk about it as a sacrament, but also... We need to realise that we're dealing with people within our own church who have not yes. been catechised in married life. Yes, uh, and the foundations that, are missing yeah, there yeah, that exactly. are necessary to be able to have those convers- to be able to have fruitful conversations right. in that immediate dimension that you're talking about. Yes, yes, um, to the degree that would be most beneficial to the Absolutely. couple, but you can't have them without the foundations yep. being there. Hundred percent. Hundred percent, and I should also add that you know I'm not playing when I say that that we have you know parents who've who've who haven't been able to image certain things to their children. I'm not playing the blame game there. No, I'm not saying no, that no, that no. you know these parents to blame for this or for that. No, no. I'm you know there's it's a a cultural shift which has occurred, and, we, and we've just not kept up with it. Yeah, the things that were normally for any parent who feels like they've failed in this regard, I guess also to be mindful that. If you've been unable to image that to your children, there's a reason for that. It's not purely because of poor motivation or um, not wanting to, not having the desire to. It's yeah. also very likely because you've not known how to and perhaps that's because you haven't been shown. So, yep. And, and that's, that's okay. Like there's no point in sitting there with therefore I've failed. No, no, it just means that there's a gap there that can be filled. Yep. Um, it's about going out and fi- figuring out what are the resources that you can pick up then so that you can change yeah. so that you can actually teach your children in the way you would like to. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I guess for anyone who's listening, don't beat yourself up. If yeah. you're hearing yeah. this at this point, we're not here to point fingers at anyone. No. Um, we just no. want to encourage a shift and a change in this space yeah. because every marriage deserves more like from the church, deserves much more in terms of support. Um, mm. And there is – resources out there we just need to be able to make them more accessible yes absolutely i guess also in terms of having this conversation um around marriage and we were talking about before about you know we have all this sex education but very little love education as well i guess that comes back to the conversations that we have about marriage and i think it needs to come back to the absolute core of what we're talking about when we're talking about marriage, which we've spoken about in a previous episode when we actually talked about marriage and we talked about how God pursues his people and that our hearts were made for spousal love with him. And that needs to be taught Mm -hmm. from day dot. Like it's not just about teaching people, teaching children that one day you might have a wedding day, you might wear a white dress, you might get down on one knee and ask a a girl to marry you. Like Mm -hmm. it's not just about that conversation. We need to be having the conversation about, yeah, but why? Why do we do that? Why do we, why is marriage important? Why is that, where does that come from? And that comes from the love of God. So we need to have that spousal love conversation with children from day dot because that's what's going to help children as they grow to understand why their hearts are looking to marriage to begin with. Yeah. Um, And that it's actually etched on our hearts. So that's a normal, natural 
you know, thing that we have. It's a natural desire that we have. And that desire stems from us wanting to be united with God. Yeah. That that's the right ordering that we need to have. So we need to have that conversation. Then when a child grows and chooses marriage, then that celebration becomes so much more. Yeah. When that core, those foundations that you were talking about before is right there. Because yeah. then we can actually talk about what the wedding feast in heaven actually yeah. means yeah. because all those other bits and pieces are in place, which is the stuff that we can't broach <laughs> no, no. when the foundations aren't there, when we don't have the core. We're kind of having to go right back to bare basics yeah. and to be able to teach yeah. in a, what, six-month gap, <laughs> six to 12 yeah. months yeah. before a couple's married. Yeah. It's asking too much, yeah. asking far too much of our people. Yeah, yeah, no, very much. And, and just by the by, when I say remote, proximate and immediate, I'm quoting directly from John Paul II in Familiaris Consortio, the consortium of the family. Marriage, just building on what you've said there, Steen, that marriage is, is sort of the theme that runs throughout the entire of the, the entirety of the scriptures. God is pursuing the heart of, of, of the human person. It's kind of always there. Why? Because God forms covenant covenants with men, yes, right? Yes. He forms a covenant with Adam. That covenant is broken. Forms a covenant with Noah. That covenant is broken. Forms a covenant with Moses. That covenant is broken. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of, you, 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 if you're sensing a theme here. Yeah. It's like we just kind of weren't getting it or something. <laughs> right, right. Forms a covenant with Abraham. The covenant is broken, right? It's, yeah, it's sort yeah. of, it's, it's, and what does God do? He comes and he renews and he saves. and He brings back. That's, that's his work. That's how he rolls. And ultimately, all of those covenants point towards the ultimate covenant, which is formed in the blood of Christ. So the, the whole of scriptures really talk about it. And, and, and just one book of the Bible to bring out there is the Song of Songs, which is just one enormous marriage song, right? And actually, it's a rather short book of the Bible, but <laughs> but, but it's, it's just one marriage song. This yeah. is beautiful. And, and, and some of the images don't make sense. Like, for instance, the groom is searching for the bride and he says, you are like a goat that I search for. <laughs> and we're all like... What? Really? <laughs> like, I'm pretty sure that even back in, in ancient Jewish times, if you had have gone, you are a wonderful goat, should have been like, you know what? I think See I'll be looking later. for somebody else. <laughs> Thanks a million, pal. Like, what is this goat business? Well, it's, it's yeah. God looking for his stubborn sheep that have, have, have left the fold, you know, searching, trying to bring them back. So there's a there's a whole subtext there in, in, in that in that book of of God searching for the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and uh, it's it's really beautiful. Mm. Uh, so it's 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 marriage is really a, it's it's just written into the scriptures and into our salvation history. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And I guess if we can have those conversations around what um, marriage images mm. here on earth, if we can have those conversations with children from a young age, then as they grow, we can then. Um, teach them really what that what the what spousal love looks like mm. within marriage and we can demonstrate then that that spousal love what that also then looks like and understand more fully what that looks like when we talk about the love that Christ has for the church his bride but also this is where we can then bring conversations around vocation as a whole yeah. into conversation so it's not just about the sacrament of marriage that we're talking about here it's a much bigger picture than that and that's where we can have conversations around well if if a person is able to understand that they're ultimately meant for union with God and they have that rightly ordered then we can have conversations around what vocation looks like and whether God is actually calling them to a sacramental marriage or if they're calling them to a celibate life and that both of them are good and beautiful and the ultimate goal bringing them to the same goal of union with God I guess then as Christians our bottom line is to be able to recognize that we're all called into spousal love with God and that we're all called to witness that on earth in some way so that when a couple comes forward for, you know, in, when they're engaged and they're preparing for marriage, they're actually better equipped and able to understand that their call isn't so much about being a witness just on one day with a great big wedding celebration that comes after it, but it's actually about the witness of their entire married lives. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. And look, precisely for this reason, John Paul II includes the celibate life in his work called The Theology of the Body. He makes the point that just as much in the celibate state, the human person is 
giving themselves in this spousal dimension, is giving themselves in this spousal love uh, because they're giving themselves to the church or they're giving themselves to God. Uh, and it's a complete and total self-giving, not only spiritually but also bodily. Uh, it, it is a, a consecration of the entire person uh, at the service of, of God and his church. Uh, and so for, for John Paul II, this notion of a covenant of marriage, of, of a covenantal uh, sort of love, is as as true for the married state as it is for the celibate state. Mm. And for this reason, he says, the celibate and religious state is complementary to the, the married state, as the married state is complementary to the celibate state. And, and these two things, they actually work together, they support each other, and you know, one is not opposed to the other or mm. higher than the other. Or they, these, these two things work together and are, are for each other. You know, and, and I think that's, that's, it's important to, to have that, that awareness. And, and look, with that awareness, when we are talking about vocation, be it marriage, be it priestly life, whatever it might be, you then realise I have a duty to care for my vocation. Yes. I have a duty to care for my marriage. I have a duty to care for my, my, my vocation as a priest. Why? Because this has been established in a covenantal love of God. You know, it's, it's not just a job that I took on for nine to five. This is a <laughs> covenant that has been forged uh, by the will of God you know, in protecting marriage or protecting priesthood or protecting you know, uh, religious life. Anything that creates a shadow or a block anything that prevents us from experiencing fully uh, the, the, the grace that, that is in our vocation, anything that obstructs us from seeing those things that need to be worked on and seeing ourselves honestly and openly in the eyes of God and in relation to our vocation, we sort of need to be aware of those blocks and those shadows and not just sit with them and be like, oh, that's there, but rather actively go, hey, there's a block or there's a shadow or there's a problem here. I need to talk to a pastor or I need to talk to my priest or I need to talk to a marriage counsellor and say, hey, there's, there's, there's an issue going on here that, that, uh, that I need to talk about and, and I, I, I just need someone to hear me out. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, yeah. And I mean on that too, I mean too often I actually hear people think that relationship counselling is only for couples who are on the brink of divorce yeah. or, you know, somehow that it's like a last, it's the last ditch, it's the last hope that they've got mm. because they've just been unable to work through whatever it is that has been a challenge for them. And I guess my my immediate thought around that is if you've hit that point where this is the last resort, you've actually waited too long. Yeah. You've waited too long to go to a relationship counsellor. Having said that, it's not so long that it can't be worked through. So there's there's no like while ever you're trying, at least you have a relationship. Yeah. It may not be as great but at least you have a relationship. When you've stopped trying altogether, that's when there is nothing there to yeah. work with. You might be yeah. living under the same roof. You might have the same monotonous routine, but if you don't actually have a relationship to work through, well, it's, it's not there. Just because yeah. you're doing the same things doesn't mean that there's something substantial there and your marriage is meant to be so much more than that. Yeah. And I guess to to put it into a bit of a an example that I think, because I think sometimes this space can get really murky with mm. emotions, kind of colouring our ability to be able to see through what's actually happening. So to put it in a very sort of simplistic example, it would be the difference between looking at, you know, so let's say you've got a, a fancy dancy Lamborghini and you're kind of sitting behind the wheel and, you know, you've got red lights going off, you've got check engine lights going off and you've been watching it for weeks and then, you know, weeks go to months and years and you're kind of thinking, ah, you know, I'm not going to take this extremely pricey, valuable car into a mechanic because it's my car. It survived, you know, this long. It'll keep going. It'll be fine. It's the comparison of that and, and comparing that with someone who's sitting behind the wheel of a Lamborghini noticing, oh, something's not right. This mm -hmm. is a little bit unusual. Oh, I've got a light going off. What's going on here? okay, this doesn't feel quite right. I'm not sure what's going on here, but it just doesn't feel the same way as when I was last sitting behind this wheel. You know what? I'm going to take it in for a service. I'm going to take it into someone who can look over it and just give me a sense of where this is at. Do I need Do I need something here? Or if I know something's going wrong, well, I'm going to take that to the, my mechanic yeah. and say, hey, yeah. this has gone wrong. What do I do? Yeah. Help me fix it. Yeah. That's the comparison that I would make with relationship counselling. Between someone who's saying... 
yes, my marriage is valuable, but I know my marriage <sighs> and yet sure there's been some issues, but I'm just going to keep going at it versus my marriage is so valuable. I'm not going to let a check engine light just go unchecked. Yeah. yeah. One of the things I say to my married couples is people don't fall out of love. They opt out of love. Yeah. Right. That's it's, you know, you didn't just wake up one day and go, Oh, I'm no longer in love with this person. Like, yeah. There's, there's been some choices that have been made before that. Um, and, and, I think one of those choices is to use your analogy is to say, oh yeah, there's a check engine light and there's something going wrong, but look, we're so busy at the moment. There's so yes. many things happening. We yes. just don't have time to take it to the mechanic. Mm-hmm. You know, I oh, was so busy at the moment. We just don't have time to go mm-hmm. to marriage council. Look, we'll, we'll be fine. We'll be fine. Look, a choice has been made there. A choice has been made there. The something has been recognized as problematic. Mm-hmm. I will be fine. You know, the, if, if there's a problem, let's go and take it. Yeah. Let's go and take it to, to someone who can, and it's, it's not because, you know, marriage counselors or, or, or relationships counselors know all about relationships or all about marriage. It's just because they know how to communicate. They've learned how to teach communication in the context of two people talking to each other, and they can teach the tools that two people need in order to communicate in a more effective manner about what their needs are and how they need to be loved in a particular moment. And 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 that's that's. I mean, you're a relationship counsellor, so correct me if I'm wrong here, but that's that's yeah. that's the way that I've, well, I've seen Look, it. M- most of us here, you know, except for the maybe the exception of, say, you know, Mr and Mrs Gottman, who's like the grandfathers of, you know, couples therapy, sure. they can probably call themselves experts. But the rest of us, like, we wouldn't call ourselves experts in relationships mm. as much as we would say we know a few things <laughs> about yeah. relationships. We see quite a few couples yeah. walk through our doors. We've seen what harmony looks like and we see what disharmony looks like. Yeah. We see what disunion – like non-united couples mm. look like and we can see what's happening to cause that yeah and we know how to help you through yeah. that yeah so just let us do yeah. our job <laughs> yeah yeah no look absolutely it's it's sort of one of the things that, that as a priest i often get thrown at is is why are you preparing people for marriage when you know you're, you're not married yeah it's like, well you know so and obviously there are certain things that i can't speak to because i'm not married so i'm not going to teach someone the, the the ins and outs of of married of married bliss or married difficulty because I don't know what that is. I'll get somebody else who is married to come in and talk about that. That's fair enough. But certainly one thing that I have recently taken on as a pastor is as part of preparation, I suggest, I don't mandate, but I really strongly suggest you go and see a couple's counsellor. Mm-hmm. Like just just yep. as a start. Yep. You know, go there see a couple's counsellor, and that way it isn't foreign to you. Yes. It's something you've been to, yes. something you've seen. You've then picked up something half decent from the counsellor. You can say, hey, we picked up a couple of skills there. That'll hold you in good stead. Like that's really sensible stuff. And, and the, the classic response is, oh, but I don't need it. It's okay. Yeah, look, no one needs it till they're, till they're you know, <laughs> uh, sort of neck deep in quicksand, right? You know? yeah, yeah. So, in fact, let's recognise the need early. Mm. Actually, you can never have too many communication skills. Mm. So let's learn some stuff from this couples counsellor. Let's accept that maybe there's a few things that we don't know and let's let's jump in and, and see what we can learn from this as a proactive exercise. Mm-hmm. Um, and and so that's um, uh, rather than waiting till till something's gone terribly wrong and and uh, I have a lot of trouble with couples where things have gone wrong mm-hmm. and they've, they've come to father, hoping yep. that father will sort the problem out. Yep. And then father says, guys, I'm going to recommend you see a, a couple's counsellor. Mm. They go, oh, no, father, we wanted to come here and see you. Well, I'm, I'm afraid I don't have the skill set to help you. Mm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a Catholic priest. My job is to help you in your spiritual realm. There is something here that is outside of my expertise, and that is you communicating as a couple. So I'd like you to go and see a couple's counsellor. Oh, no, 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 no. But th- then there's something wrong with our marriage. Yeah, there, 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 there is, and, and you ain't perfect, and yep. You, you, you're probably not going to fix it on your own because at the end of the day, we're a church, we rely on each other. And uh, part of that is, well, is is saying, well, there's there's a Catholic marriage or couples counsellor down the road. Why don't we jump in and see that person? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's so strange that we have so many barriers and blocks that we put up when it comes to the most vulnerable parts, which I think is why we get so def- – we have couples who get so defensive about – uh, seeking out help because really that that's the space where you can be most vulnerable yeah. is in that married relationship. Mm. And so to think that something could be going not so great is a very vulnerable thing to admit to. Yeah, It says it, it's almost particularly for people who get so caught up in this with a very disordered idea of what their vocation is like. If they've found their identity 
mm. in this perfect couple, yeah. then that's going to make it twice as hard. Whereas doing what you're doing, Padre, and suggesting that they actually go and see a counsellor before they've even married takes away that stigma. It takes away those barriers that's as right. to what ifs. Like you don't need all this other additional anxieties around what does couples counselling look like? What does it feel like? What are they going to ask? How is this going to be? You don't need all of that when you're at the brink of divorce. Yeah. Like you don't, yep. you just don't need that. So yep. even just going a couple of times, two or three times, so you get a sense of it, you know what it's like, you know where you can go, you know how long it's going to take, you know what kind of questions they might ask, takes away all that unknown and will just ease for when you feel like, mm, we might need a... We might need a little service yep. in here. Spot on the money. Um, yep. yep. But I also know that, you know, I like I see couples who don't just come to me because they've had a breakdown in their relationship. They come to me also because they want to improve on their relationship. Mm. So it's mm. not just people. Like people who seek out couples counselling aren't always the ones who are on the brink of divorce. Yeah. They're not the ones who are sitting there going, I've, you know, uh, I've had an affair and I don't know how to how to move past this. Like yes. that's yes. not what every couple is about. There are lots of couples who come forward saying, you know what, our relationship wasn't isn't where it used to be mm. and we don't know how to get it back to that and we don't know what our relationship is going to look like in future. Mm. And couples who are empty nesters, like all their children have grown up and they find themselves lost and they don't yeah. really know yeah. what their relationship is like anymore. So they come to couples counselling mm. to try and help them navigate what this new season in their life looks like. There is nothing wrong with that. That's so awesome. It's, it That's is. That's so awesome. It That's is. Just, it's yeah. a new season yeah. in their married yeah. life. And it speaks to the covenant, right? It does. It speaks to the covenant that two people are like, you know what, this is uncomfortable, but let's yeah. lay this discomfort down yeah. for each other. Absolutely. I, th- I just find that so, yeah. so encouraging. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then the same in the same vein too, there are also couples who come forward who will say, hey, one or both, you know, I've got some wounds in my past. I have some traumas in my past or I've been abused in my previous relationships and I think that's playing out in my current relationship and I don't know what to do or I've, I'm afraid it's going to play out in my next relationship and I don't know what to do or in the current relationship that I'm in I don't know what to do. Like those are also the couples who are coming forward who are being proactive. Yeah. Absolutely yeah. being proactive, but they're also looking for ways that they can support each other yeah. to make yeah. a healthier, yeah. happier, more fulfilling marriage. And so when you say playing out, you mean like the fear of being abused or the sort of feelings of dread or terror or whatever they might be are cropping up despite the fact that the physical signs or the the emotional signs or you know the the sort of warning signs aren't actually there that by all accounts you're in a healthy relationship but those those feelings of a past relationship that 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 you've been wounded with is is making itself felt in this now current and healthy relationship yeah. is that what you mean yeah absolutely yeah, yeah that's yeah. definitely one of the dynamics that could come yeah. up yeah yeah 100% yeah. um and this and also i also see couples who come in you know for a short period of time so they might come in for say six sessions and then they're done others who will come in for like a year maybe there's some other things that they're working through particularly past traumas they can yes. take a while to work through um and then there i have others who come every six months or every 12 months just because they want to check in yeah they just want to go you know what it's been a little while we just want to do a bit of an overview a bit of a review here's what we're up to are you seeing anything, Any anything you can leave us with to think about and ponder over the next six months? Okay, cool. We'll see you when you come back, yeah, yeah. if you choose to come back. So, it, like, you can make it, couples therapy, you can make it what you need. That's the whole mm. point of any form of therapy. It needs to be helpful for you. So dialogue with your therapist yeah. around what you actually want. But don't be afraid to put your hand up and say, I have an imperfect marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, It's yeah. going to be nobody, like, nobody. Yeah. Nobody yeah. expects you to have a perfect marriage. The only perfect on marriage going on is the wedding banquet in heaven. Exactly. Yeah. So if you think you've got a perfect marriage, you are kidding yourself. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Too right. Or if you think somebody else, if you think there's another couple that you're seeing has a perfect marriage, no. you're kidding yourself. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. Um, um, and for those who who also put up a barrier of time, uh, that you were saying before, it takes too much time. I don't have the time, or it's too much money. Mm. I don't have the money for it. Look at it as an investment. Like yeah. this is this isn't a hobby that you're. This is not an added extra that you're putting onto mm. your 
um, marriage, this is an investment that you're yeah. making in the most important relationship that you have with another person. Both on a time and a monetary investment. Yes. Yeah. All right. So to, to finish then on a on a bit of bit of a positive note about the beauty of marriage, because we've 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 gone pretty deep into mm. the whole mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. when marriage goes awry sort of thing, and <laughs> and uh, uh, so just to finish on a on a, on a note of the beauty of marriage and St. John Paul II catechesis on, this, on the theology of the body. Um, he talks about the Song of Songs. And just before he starts this, he's like, we recently broke for uh, for a period of time. We recently stopped our catechesis and now we return. And, and, and what that's code for is, I got shot. <laughs> <laughs> there was an assassination attempt. There was an assassination attempt and I nearly died. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> right, so... Uh, <laughs> And just kind of glosses over yeah. that with, we had a bit of a break. Yeah, <laughs> bit of a break, sure. <laughs> just had a nap. Good on you, jump on a second, yeah. Oh. But uh, he, he goes in and talks about the Song of Songs, that book I mentioned earlier in the episode. And, and um, he makes the point that the Song of Songs really is this beautifully expressed spousal love between God and his church. And that that's the image upon which every marriage is founded. Every marriage is founded upon the relationship between God and his church. And, and you know, he, he hits on how does God interact with his church? How does he relate with his church? He lays his life down for his church. That's what he does. Mm. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21, St. Paul talks about husband and wife. You know, wives be obedient to your husbands. Mm. And it's like, that, <laughs> that doesn't that doesn't sit well with modern sensibilities. Mm. Well, hang on a second. Let's go the line before. St. Paul gives an interpretive key for everything he's about to say. Be subject to one another mm-hmm. in obedience to Christ. Mm-hmm. Uh, so wives, be obedient to your husbands. Husbands, lay your life down for your wives as Christ laid his life down for the church. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't just mean be willing to throw your body in front of her. <laughs> no, 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 no. It means you must love her as Christ loved the church. It means that every single day, the husband must die to himself for the sake of his wife. And in this way, exercise not a leadership of dominance, but a servant leadership uh, so that the, the, the marriage might look like a, like a rather glorious dance. Mm. Um, now, we all need help and instruction with our dance. <laughs> not everyone's dance is perfect. Believe me, mine sure isn't. It's meant to be a dance that the Lord has initiated. Uh, it's meant to look like the, the covenant between God and his church. It's meant to look like one laying down one's life for the sake of another in the name and after the example of our blessed Lord. Uh, you know, this is what, what John Paul is really driving home is that the way that God chases after our hearts and lays his life down for our hearts, this is the manner in which husband and wife uh, are to lay down their lives for each other. And so, uh, you know, I, I, I hold married couples in, in, in my prayers. I, I pray for you every day. And married couples, I ask you, please, Remember our celibates and religious in your prayers too. Mm. And uh, let's help each other out. Mm. Yeah, Beautiful. Well, there you go. There's an episode on marriage preparation for you. Before we end this episode, we might do a truth, beauty and goodness, Padre. Yeah. So recently we had First Holy Communion Mm. at at my parish, at the parish of Cathedral. And uh, it was so beautiful. You know, year three students who were – so beautifully prepared for their by you know, and God bless their teachers. They did a you know a really admirable job in in preparing them and um and you know just just such beautiful kids with beautiful hearts and and uh, for them to receive Jesus for the first time mm. was just oh it's just so absolutely marvelous. So I just finished reading another mini book by. Jacques Philippe, mm. searching for and maintaining peace. Yeah, I was actually listening to it via audiobook on a drive recently. It's really good, mm. like really good. And you finish the book and you're like, Whew, okay, that was really good. And then there's like the appendix where he has little sections from different saints. Nice. <laughs> and then you're like, <laughs> you get hit with these like power hits just when you thought the book was over. <laughs> so, yeah, it's worth worth a read or worth listening to via audio Wonderful. if you've got the time. It's not very big, not, not Thank very you. long. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for this week's episode of Living Fullness. We hope there was something in there that was useful or helpful for you. We will catch you again next week, but until then, all our love and praise. God bless.